So this one. So what do we? So we want to project to show Okay, uh, I'm going to put it here. So I do this to show you. Show you. Yeah. Okay. And you can you can leave them all open if you want to just minimize it and then just okay. Yeah. It's we got them. It's working now, but I don't. No, about the first person. No, I know them. I just write people. So I'll do them. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. done. I, I know. That's great. It seemed well, but I don't see it. It's not here. And then where is Why is that? I still my brain. He's definitely. I saw him. I know. I'm just saying you're something. Yeah, I know. Not just look up when they're pregnant. They're going to have a problem. That's why we asked him to come. Okay. That's fine. Welcome everyone. We should be starting in the next two minutes. So you may be Hello, welcome everyone. Um, we'll be, we're supposed to be starting this session a half past. Uh, we expect one of our presenters to be here, will be the first presenter. Because he's not yet here, we're going to start with the second presenter as we wait for him to join us. Uh, in that case, in today's presentation, it's about sanitation, where we are going to get presentations from three presenters and hear from Ben Tingwell from World Vision, 
that have been the first presenter, but since he's not yet here, we'll start with the second presenter. And that's going to be Nelson, who will be talking to us about filling the, the barred sanitation infrastructure data gap in the United States. I'll, I'll probably invite him to take on the floor. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for attending today's session. I'm Nelson Deleuz. I'm a postdoc at UMass Amherst. And today I'll be presenting on the work that I've been doing with Emily Kumpel and Jay Tanasia on how we can tackle the problem of finding out where our buried sanitation infrastructure in the US is located. To start off with some background, I think that um, the, the statement's obvious to everyone in this room and really at this conference, but safe management of human waste is crucial for ensuring human and environmental health. And, a fact is that at least 20% of the US's population likely uses on site wastewater treatment systems or OWTS. However, the last national census of the prevalence of where sanitation systems are located nationally was conducted as part of the 1990 US census which if we check our calendars, that's over 30 years ago now at this point. So as a result of that, we have a significant gap in our understanding of the number, locations, and density of on-site systems across the United States. So, our question is, how can we find out where these on-site systems are? There's geospatial on-site system and or sewer data uh, available in different localities throughout the United States. Um, but what we wanna do here is use other indicators to fill in the gaps of where that data isn't so clearly available to us. And <clears throat> with that, we fill the gaps between the sanitation coverage data that's available um, with estimates. So that sounds like a great idea, but is it actually something that's possible? So today I'll be presenting a proof of concept of this idea um, where we will test methods in a place that has ground truth data that will let us know how well our methods perform then once we have an idea of how confident we can be in those estimates, apply the method to other places. And hopefully a long-term goal is to see how this method might work where we don't have consistent data available. For our proof of concept for today, we're going to be using data from the state of Florida and Florida's water management inventory. This is, a great source of ground truth data on where buried sanitation infrastructure is located. Um, I would say from, at least from what I've, I've found in various searches online, that it's probably really the best source of ground truth data, um, at least on a statewide basis um, in, in the US for where this infrastructure is located. Another reason why Florida is a good place to do this is that throughout the 67 different counties in the state of Florida, each one has a differing population density, each one has a different distribution of types of sanitation infrastructure that's used there. Um, so it makes it a, a good place to test this uh, method that we're going to be talking about today. So our goal overall is to predict whether individual parcels or properties have a sewer connection and on-site sanitation system or neither. How are we gonna do that? Broadly speaking, we are going to be using machine learning. Um, machine learning is part of the artificial intelligence field. 
It focuses on the development of computer programs that can access data and then use it to learn for themselves. This enables us to analyze massive quantities of data that we otherwise wouldn't. Um, and what it really boils down to in this context is pattern matching. For the work that I'm presenting today, I use the tidy models framework, um, which is part of a collection of packages in the R statistical computing language, specifically for this purpose of modeling and machine learning. What does our machine learning look like in practice? What we do is we take data from a variety of sources and then we calculate metrics such as road and building density. We take data from other US census uh, products that are more up to date, such as whether a place is an incorporated place or not, data from the American Community Survey. We also take data from assessor, uh, tax assessor databases and real estate and information that we calculate on proximity to the closest um, wastewater uh, resource recovery facility, as well as land cover data. So we take data from all of these sources. We <clears throat> then infer the, the system coverage for the buried sanitation infrastructure using machine learning models with a two-step technique or two-step or two-stage technique. In our first stage, we categorize an area or property as having sanitation infrastructure or not. So why, why this is important to figure out in the first place is <clears throat> there are some places that perhaps it's a large uh, wildlife preserve or something that doesn't necessarily need um, sanitation infrastructure. So it simplifies our classification to break it into two different stages. Um, in our second stage, then if we've identified that a property has some need for sanitation infrastructure, we can categorize it as served by an on-site system or a sewer system. Then combining these two stages together, we can make a prediction and get an inferred sewer network sewer network coverage or infer on-site system coverage. In summary, we're taking all of the features that describe a parcel of property, and then we figure out which features and thresholds are best for separating our data set into our different classes of interest. Standard methods in machine learning and statistics tell us that we should test multiple models when we are trying out machine learning for a classification problem. So here we test out two different methods. The first is the classification tree. This is a method where objects are assigned a class depending on meeting certain properties. So for example, this could mean if a property has a building of at least a certain size and it meets these other conditions, then we can predict that there's some sort of sanitation infrastructure there. And that's the general way that the, the classification tree model works. Then we also test out the random forest ensemble method. So from the word forest, you can maybe piece together that what that is, it's a group of a lot of different classification trees. So instead of just using one classification tree to make a prediction, Classification trees are trained using different portions of available data. And then <clears throat> the output of the random forest classifier is the class that's selected by the majority of these trees. For today's presentation, I am going to be evaluating our model's performance in terms of the accuracy rate. The accuracy rate is a performance metric that tells us the fraction or proportion of predictions that are correct. So our true positives and true negatives over the total number of predictions that are made. 
Next up, I will be jumping into our results. And for our results, we <clears throat> have a data set that takes up to 10,000 um, properties in each county in Florida, and then separates it into a portion for training the model, and then a separate portion, which the results are going to show that the model never saw while it was being trained um, to see how the model performs. So I will be jumping into that now and presenting results on how we do in our two different stages of classification. So in our first classification, we are asking the question, does the property have sanitation infrastructure, yes or no? On the left side, we have how the classification tree method performed across the state on our testing data set. We had a mean accuracy of 95.4%. But then when we use the random forest classifier, our accuracy increases slightly to 96.6%. So it's better. Um, and we also see that there are more counties that have higher than 96% accuracy using the random forest classifier method. So th this shows um, that the random forest is probably better to use than the classification tree for this problem. Then we have our second classification, which is a bit more interesting, um, where between our two methods, there's a more stark difference between the classification tree where we have a mean accuracy across the state of 88.6%. But when we use the random forest classifier, that mean accuracy jumps up to 96%, um, which is a really good result. It's a seven and a half percentage points in accuracy better. And it suggests that the random forest is really the way to go for this classification problem, um, barring testing other methods, of course. So this is all well and good, um, but for the maps that are shown here, we used training data from all of the counties in Florida. So perhaps there's maybe some bias that, that, that may have leaked in there. So in order to evaluate that question um, and to see <clears throat> whether our predictions work well when we don't have information available, we ran a few additional experiments. We, to do this, we left out a portion of counties in central Florida from our model's training data set and then saw how we performed in those counties using the random forest classifier. So we can see here a bit sadly that our accuracy drops down to 82% from where it was up at 96%. Um, for, for these five counties when there's no training data available for them. But the good news is that with even small amounts of added known data for these regions, uh, so adding 500 labels of, of training data from each of those five counties, we can increase the performance from 82% to 91%. The implication of this is that when we <clears throat> go and test this method in other states in the US that we have some evidence to show that even having a little bit of ground truth data, even if there's not the extent of, of ground truth data that's available like there is in the state of Florida, that we'll still be able to come up with pretty good estimates, which is an encouraging result. To summarize the impact of our work so far, we have developed a workflow for the geospatial data processing for input into our models. And this proved efficient for processing the geospatial data across all the counties in Florida. And from some preliminary testing, which it didn't show here, it also shows promise for application in other geographies in the US. We developed a machine learning workflow using the Titan Models framework in R that works well for this classification problem. And on the results side of things, we have estimates of sanitation infrastructure coverage using this method that have high accuracy across the state of Florida, which is an encouraging result. 
And our method also shows promise for use in other geographies with limited ground truth data um, that we can add little bits of that data onto our existing data set from Florida and potentially get good results with that process. So with that, I'm really happy to take any questions on what I presented here. And also, if anyone knows of a, a really good um, data set for ground truth data where buried sanitation infrastructure is for some other state in the US, I'd be really happy to hear about it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nelson, for that great presentation. Uh, we'll have about three or four questions in the next five minutes. Um, so, yeah. yes. Thank you. Um, what maybe you mentioned it, what is the distribution of the data? With what proportion um, has uh, sewers, for example? So, for this um, project, there are for the state of Florida, there's about 4.2 million parcels in their data set that um, have sewer compared to about 2 million that have uh, septic or on site. Um, however, for the, the purposes of training the model here, we balanced out those classes um, in order to prevent um, over predicting the presence of sewer in any given county. And then also for the testing that was also balanced. Yeah, we made sure it was balanced throughout the process. Yes. I haven't read that. I'm not the one, but if, um, so will you know? Is there a possibility that you would like essentially right now this was just looking at sewer versus the idea of a septic, right? But technically, could that septic be a drain pipe or just a regular tank, or you know? Could, is there any way for you to start differentiating that, or is it just sort of the A or B at this point? At, at this point, it's really the kind of A or B testing. Okay. Is this a, a connected to a sewer line, yeah. or some is it of, some variety of on site? Like you said, it could potentially be standpipe or um, a septic or, or something else altogether. Um, that, that's where we're at at this point, but it's definitely an interesting point to be considering in the future. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for really interesting work. I was wondering if you considered using any um, spatial data sets that might have implications for septic tank suitability, like soil type or depth to water table. Um, did you consider that? And yes. Um, so I did some initial testing with um, a data product that had some of that information on soil type and um, depth to groundwater and, and whatnot. Um, it did not particularly have a strong impact on the predictions that this model was able to make. Um, but where I see the importance of that data coming down the line is um, in terms of seeing this is what we predicted here. Is it suitable that this thing is here? Um, so kind of more of a different type of analysis um, that that data could be really useful for down the line. I think we, we have one question at the end. I think someone had a question that, yes. Aaron. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Um, do you think that it's possible the data from Florida to get to population and flow? I'm sorry. Is it possible using your data set in Florida to get to population, the number of people, and then the possible flow rate of all these systems in total? Um, there's probably a, a way to get to it eventually. Um, I haven't pr put particular thought into into that question yet, um, but I I think that tying those things together will be an important path forward for this work. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. It's such an interesting topic. All right. Um, we, as, as we said, we had the first presenter who was not yet here, but I don't think he's here yet. Ben.
Okay, since Ben is, if Ben is not here, we can go to the last presenter, and that's going to be Claire from Center of Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology. She will speak, she'll be speaking to us about stabilized soil lining for feed lapis and sandy soil condition and using some baseline kind of findings from a very good Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Taya. I am a wash advisor at COST, the Center for Affordable Water and Sanitation Technology, based in Canada. My current work involves providing training and capacity development services to WASH organizations, um, but I have also lived and worked in Liberia for many years, almost 10, um, doing a variety of different community-led WASH projects and also WASH in, in Ebola treatment settings. Um, I'm here today, though, to present this work because I think it will be useful for other contexts, other contexts that struggle with pit latrine collapse. Um, and also to hear from anyone in this room who may have experience using this method. If you do, I would be really happy to connect with you after this session. So um, in this presentation, we'll look at the problem of literally construction in low resource sandy soil locations. And then I'll introduce the stabilized soil method, um, stabilized soil lining method and why we were interested in it. And then I'll just explain the project and survey methods what we learned and the next steps. So pit latrine collapse due to unstable soil is a challenge in many locations, not just in Liberia. Unlined pits dug in unstable soil often results in very short-term latrine use due to rapid pit degradation, um, or just simply a lack of latrine ownership at all because people consider it impossible to successfully build a latrine. Um, and both of these outcomes obviously have risks for public health and safety. So um, the community-led total sanitation approach has been widely used in Liberia since 2009, and it has been very effective in, um, in raising awareness about open defecation and the risks, but it has not been as effective in um, getting people to have sustained access to latrines. So um, there was a recent sanitation market assessment done by USAID, um, I think just last year, and it found that 39% of households that reverted back to open defecation did so due to structural damage to their latrine, including pit collapse. So there are a number of pit lining options available. Um, these are just a few. So we have the corbel latrine, tires or oil drums, um, kind of rebar or wire cages. We have sandbags. There are different prefabricated linings. The one um, picture here is called the Dignalu, and it is used in Ghana and promoted by, by global communities. We have sticks, bamboo, um, and concrete rings, and all of these um, certainly have their pros and cons, but they all have shortcomings as well. Um, and it's quite difficult to find a lining that, that meets all of the needs of the, the user. Uh, which is what we would like to do. So um, obviously priorities differ across different communities, but in general, we have found that the things that are important to people is that it should be low cost, it should use locally available materials, resist soil pressure, allow liquid infiltration, um, be made of materials that resist decomposition, be fairly easy to construct and install, have a reasonably long lifespan, and in some situations, uh, it's important that it can be empty. So um, Empowerment Rehabilitation Services is a local Liberian NGO that works in coastal communities with very sandy soil. So they have seen uh, many community-led total sanitation projects fail because of pit uh, collapse. And just to highlight how sandy it really is, the, the picture on the bottom right is um, some of their staff and a government representative walking in the community, not on the beach. So the soil is, is indeed very sandy. Um, and they reached out to us to help us come up with some um, solutions for their context that would be suitable. Um, and many of the options that were currently or traditionally used in, in Liberia 
they found to be expensive, required a bit too much masonry skill, um, and limited the pit capacity. So um, that's what we did. Um, we did a bit of, of a bit of research, and we came across the stabilized soil lining method um, that has been used in Ethiopia by IDE. Um, so the document is there on the bottom. Um, but this method uses the principles of rammed earth construction and a small amount of cement to create a lining that supports against pit wall collapse. Um, so we decided to try it. Uh, we constructed a single latrine in Monrovia in June 2021. And then based on the successful first construction, we did an assessment um, to choose a, a pilot location. Um, and then in collaboration with the government of Liberia, the, the rural coastal community of Sembaden was chosen. Um, agreements were signed with the community in October 2021. And then from October to December 2021, uh, ERS constructed 23 of these latrines covering the entire community. And then in March of this year, we did the first evaluation, which I will share with you in just a moment. Um, but before we do, I'm gonna share a video, believe it or not. <laughs> on um, how this, this, this lining looks. So just to give you a flavor of what this um, stabilized soil lining does. Uh, a little mold about 0.8 meters in diameter and about 2.5 um, centimeters high. And then um, we take the excavated material from the pit and sift it through uh, six Pardon me, six millimeters so to just make the same for one hundred and three large pumps. And then you take that sifted and collect the material. I'm just going to take part sand and one part cement and a small amount of water just to add the cement. Um, the mold is lowered into the pit and then that mixture is taken um, and added kind of in layers of about four inches. Um, and then tamped or compacted down to about two inches. And then as you work up towards the ground level, um, the mold is kind of wiggled up until you reach the ground surface. And then uh, we add it. Well, we add it on the top after um, the pit lining has been given some time to cure. And then in this pilot project, the community was responsible for constructing their own superstructures. Um, which we did, which they did in a way that was suitable for them. So um, in March, we did an evaluation of this project and surveyed 22 of the 23 homes that received the latrines. We looked at user satisfaction, perceived costs, and overall feedback. Um, two focus group discussions were also done with men and women um, to understand more of the nuances of how they um, felt about the latrines and then some observational assessments as well. Um, so what we learned um, was that we were able to dig pits to a depth um, ranging from 3 to 6.6 .6 feet. With an average depth of, of 5.8 feet, the limiting factor in this community was the very high water table level um, because we were so close to the coast. Um, the average depth of fecal sludge was about 1.3 inches after three months of use. So based on this, we estimate the expected pit lifespan will be um, six and a half to seven years for a family of eight. The cost of the pit lining is $2 USD per foot, which was higher than hoped and expected. Um, and one of the, I think, reasons related to this was it was quite challenging to dig a perfectly um, one meter diameter pit, <laughs> usually as you dig and go out the, um, the diameter increases a bit, which increased the volume that was required to backfill, and that also increased the cost of the cement. And then the average cost of the superstructure was around 30 USD, which was a cost deemed acceptable to the household. So um, survey participants reported satisfaction with their latrines. They spoke about having confidence in the, in the pit. Um, and the, uh, the slab integrity and said that um, this latrine had already at the time of the survey lasted quite a bit longer than previous constructions. They also mentioned, um, uh, pardon me, they commented on the shame associated with open defecation and how they no longer experienced this. Uh, it was observed that open defecation had been dramatically reduced in the community. 
the majority of the latrines were at the time of visit in, in, in good condition and were clean. Um, and we did notice as well through the survey um, a preference among some people or a desire for poor flush toilets as opposed to um, pit latrines. Uh, one of the reasons that was given for this was just the belief that pit latrines contribute to disease or yeast infections, especially, especially among women. Um, and that a poor flush toilet was somewhat more aspirational than just a pit latrine itself. So um, how much did the latrines really cost? Around 68 USD for the materials. So it's important to note that ERS and cost did subsidize the pit lining and the cost of the slab, um, while the costs covered by the community included the superstructure and hand washing station. Um, and how does this compare to other options? So compared to commonly used options in Liberia, um, this is, I think, affordable. It, it would be considered affordable, but it's been not, not indeed the cheapest. Um, whereas like, pardon, oil drums uh, remain um, more, more cost effective than the pit landing. So coming back to the list that I shared with you earlier, um, this method does indeed meet a number of local needs. The big questions for us now are, um, is it low cost enough? Will people be willing to spend $2 per foot on, on a lining such as this one? Um, we don't yet know if it can withstand emptying. So this is a question that may not be important for this community where um, there's ample space to fill the I mean, train once one has been filled, but it, we, this is something that we'd like to know. Um, and then one that we've uh, added since is, is it desirable? So people had focused a little bit on their desire for a poor flush toilet. Um, is, is this what people are really looking for? So our next steps, um, we will do a second evaluation of the project in February 2023. This will bring us to um, one full uh, year of use and one full year of, of quite an intense rainy season. So it will be good to see how they withstand that. And then after that final evaluation or second evaluation, um, we'll determine if scale up is recommended or not. Um, we would like to explore the possibility of um, adapting this to a kind of poor flush configuration and if that's possible. Um, and then uh, we have collaborated with the government of Liberia on this project from the beginning. They were involved in the site selection and have done the first evaluation with it. We will continue to share our learnings with them. Um, and other sanitation practitioners in Liberia. And uh, if this method is considered suitable, um, we'll look for ways that it can complement the national open defecation um, strategy for ending open Thank you for your attention. Well, um, thank you so much for that great presentation. I know there are some questions from the audience and probably several several some of those questions. What's the, what's the lifespan on the drum, like oil drum lining? How long does it last? Less long. I, that, so it's a smaller diameter pit. <laughs> um, obviously, um, just a smaller volume will fill up more quickly. I, I couldn't give you uh, a, a number at this moment, but there's a calculation we can do if you can figure out the volume. So I, I don't know exactly. Yes. Yes. With a lifespan of approximately seven years for a family of eight, do you provide instructions or is there a mechanism for those families to safely, safely abandon or decommission the pet tree once it's uh, out of life? Yeah, so the um, kind of traditional way it's done in that area is to remove the slab, reuse it, build a pit, plant a tree over it, and then dig another hole. In this community, there, there are only 23 homes in the community, and uh, it's a farming community, so there's lots of space to do that. Um, we, in this project, did not focus on, you know, decommissioning, um, but I think that that would be kind of the logical um, steps that people would take and do often. Do. I think you mentioned there was varying depths of the latrine. Um, did you guys do anything else because of the high water table or any modifications because of the high water table? Uh, no, we, we considered we considered looking at perforation of the um, 
of the lining, but that is not necessary. The soil is so sandy that infiltration happens quite easily on its own. And then, yeah, it, it was, to me, it was quite surprising how much the water table varied in the community. So um, the community was divided by a road and on one side, the water table was significantly different from the other side. Um, but we didn't you know, we didn't really do anything besides not to dig deeper. The, the numbers that you show the cost of dollars for each right? Yes. Is that good labor all the cost? No, um, that is the cost of the cement. So um we we in, in this project we trained three masons in the community, two men and, and one woman. Um they volunteered their time to to do that. Um but the yeah the cost for them are shared are uh, purely material costs and transportation, I suppose. Yes, transportation and material. Right, so that there are no questions, but I also have a question. I think I'm allowed to ask a question. So, in your presentation, you probably mentioned that you're mixing uh, sand and cement to a ratio of one to 10. I'm looking, I'm thinking through the strengths of that motor. And then you probably use that as a piece, and I'm seeing that as something that's going to collapse because the strength of that motor, if the liquid starts to extrude through that motor, I feel like that's a really very weak motor. I don't know how strong you test the strength of that or you didn't. Uh, well, this is what we're looking at, right? So we've only done one evaluation. The latrines, the, the last latrines were completed in December. So um, Rainy season is, is over about now, and we'll go back in February and see how they've withstood uh, the first rainy season, which has been a, a real good one. <laughs> it's rained a lot this year. Um, it is a weak mix, that's true. Um, I think the, the promise in this method, uh, I'll call it, is, is that it, it is low cost. So we want to um, use as little cement as possible and still have a quality lining. All right, I think it's, it's better like you check that from there. By the time you finish, by the time you finish the top structure, it's already collapsed down. So you probably think you've done the line, but done is already failing, given so, the, the motor, the, the mix of the, you know, the kind of mix ratio you use. Yeah. Maybe in prison, you know, at least to probably three or something, that would be actually better to, to give you a stronger kind of motor and to go back to. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. I think. It seems like we've said some kind of 20 minutes uh, because the first presenter didn't show up. So we've had two great presentations on. And I think, thank you so much for showing up on site for such a great presentation. And you have 20 minutes to connect with each other and see future collaborations. Thank you. Thank you.
So I think, um, I'm a researcher with them. So for me, I think a lot of processes have been on the research side of things, but also the biology side. That's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, but I think the class that you just said, the whole person to talk to. Yeah. yeah. Who's uh, that? Olivia. Right. Tell me more about your area of expertise. And so, what's your area of expertise? Then I'll show you the best. Very good. 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 Very I know I've looked for it. So what I have been now looking at for and it's a very bad That's the first thing I know that I don't know. So if I focus on the compost, so my colleague, I have a presentation there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what we do is we don't have to people slide with them. Yeah, it's my it's presented on the on the Oh, yes. I was like, finally, yeah. Yeah. Um, How's your 
say the conference. Yeah, it's been really good. It's like my first in person conference. I've done a couple of virtual yeah. ones over the weekend. Thank you. 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 So both so Rick Johnston and Dean Stauber are two guests today. Neither of them have ever, and so they, they're established. <laughs> Yeah, how how is that panel there? It, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, it's the first time I've run, but in the yeah. yeah. I've been here and I've been around and I think it's gone. It's a very exciting. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to go. It's always cool to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Put you out and I'm going to get going. Thank you so much for that representation. Thank you. 
the line was in Yes, we survived. <laughs> we made it through. All right. So yeah, it's a pleasure meeting you. That's really interesting. You know, thank you. Doing a great job. Can you have your contact? Sure. Yeah. And then, I am. Uh, I am watching. Yeah. I'm grateful you actually walking. Walking. Oh, we were sure. I didn't see your. Life. Yeah. So this guy is all. You know, I think I missed the right path. But yeah, I'm not just simple person. Okay. 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 Well, thank you for your comments. Um, yeah, it's, you're doing a great work, and, and that's what you know. I focus on low cost plantation, and that one of them, low cost plantation, which can do the job and still come. But and maybe what we could probably think of later is to look at how can we protect. What benefits do you get mm -hmm. shifting from open vegetation to this? Um. Because there, there are benefits that people should know that you know what if you shift from open education to something like this, you have to get this reduction in in, in pathogens flying in your community, or you get this reduction in yeah. public. So that would be another thing to message to because you know, some people are going to be like, this is no cost. Why are you telling us to do this? But if you tell them, hey, this is open education. Yeah. You know, if you shift from this yeah. to this. You have this benefit that come along. You know, there's no reduction in exposure to people pathogens. There's less reduction to you know, do all these kind of things right. and do that kind of great things to, to Yeah, we found that in these communities that that is not as meaningful to people as just the comfort. Um, the comfort of having the machine seemed to be a bigger motivator. Why? For people than health impacts. Health impacts. Which I think for you and me is maybe hard to understand. Um, but I mean, everyone's different, right? The people that will different things. If you're a mom whose kid is always sick, maybe yeah. the health impact will. Would probably do. Yeah, but even the comfort, I'll be proud to some of the standards that we stand on the ground, things allowing people to get that comfort that they have got, you know, kind of. Beginning to coming up and privacy and yeah, that's already in company. They, they won't care what happens down there as long as they, they have quite a choice of the kind of one use. Right. And that's something that I really important to people to right. and it's what we, if they have that, then that's okay. We just make it simple on how the structures work and how we can talk to them and how we can 
So I think that should be fine. Yeah. And I don't know if you tried out different types of sand. So the sand, which is coarse, mm -hmm. is more good to use than fine sand. Yeah. No, we haven't. We've just taken what's excavated from the pit and, the pit and we use the same thing. We use the same, yeah, back down before, which is easy. Yeah, that's easy. But easy yeah. isn't always. Yeah, easy. That, that's very good. Well done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, too. You. What, what do you teach? Here. So I am a wood and sanitation person, but I do most of the sanitation. So I yeah. my work focused on local sanitation. Uh, I look at sanitation technologies, septic tank systems. I look at all those types. I classified people call septic tanks septic tanks, but I came out and found out they're not. So I give a new classification of their line fits, their line tanks, that you know, you know, you know, fully aligned. So I give that new classification. Oh. So I do cool. more of that, and, and then I do more. So I do infrastructure, mostly sanitation infrastructure. Okay. And then I also go ahead and look at uh, barriers to sanitation in these communities. How do we help them? People living in kind of these communities, which are really hard to reach, you know, uh, in extreme weather, things that actually mess up with access. So I try to look at how we do that. Okay. So I look, cool. at, but I'm also an engineer who looks at also waste of treatment. Uh, you know, it's a resource recovery, yeah. how we combat that into a resource recovery. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Those yeah. are important topics. Yes. Are you, is it, have you presented at uh, this conference? No, I'm not. I've, I've been here for over six years. I've been presenting this, this year. Hasn't been <laughs> this year, I was like, no, I just want to meet more people. I need have to a break. connect more with people and, you know, look at well, how can I help this sector? What are the people I can work with who are working on things that are interesting? Yeah. And that's why when I was speaking, which model to moderate this session, I was like, I need this session. So I think they're talking about things online. Mm -hmm. So I actually look at, oh, we're talking about people actually, they're talking about, oh, thank you, this, thank you, this, and see what yeah. they're doing and what they think we can do together and what they think is making sense to, to do together. Thank yeah, you. That's what I'm yeah. It's really interesting. It's, I think it's nice to not present and people to really listen to. No, it's no, it's good to present. I was presenting the last six years. I've been presenting every. I've been presenting. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I've been enjoying it. I've been. That's how people have got to know me. And I'm got to know me from. That's why when they talk about safety, thank you was looking at me because that's how they got to know me <laughs> yeah. over and over. And it's, yeah, it is. It's a great thing. It's great. Thank you. This is really great. It's a great, great thing to. I'm yeah, glad you're looking at it. I'm glad you're looking at such a question. Yeah, it's a need. Uh, it's a need. Uh, I don't know how I've done that institution. I'm going to teach you. Isn't that a lot? Yeah, I think it's just a good thing. Thank 
So two things that we want to do first. Mm -hmm. The report. Yes. Uh, and the uh, so I mean you know, we've probably done a zillion times. So I guess uh the next point all together. Yes, the as we saw maybe I can you know sharing on the report to the center of the report. Who shared it? Plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, maybe they uh, uh, made a topic on, I think, asking for extension is very important. For extension, for extension, for extension, for extension, for extension, for for extension, for extension, for extension, for so on the, maybe maybe give us a week. Uh, I didn't think I'm also asking Jackie for this for this things with it. He comes to share us next uh, week Monday. So the report? Sorry, but yeah. So is that the case? We need uh, more time to finalize. So uh, maybe we can decide that the correct. Uh, we are also doing this basis, so we need two weeks to that way. That's that's an important. Yeah, I got it. I got my it. But they just have to wait. That's why I have probably considering all the again suffering on the way out, which we will be in mood to give us that. So you want to go ahead and ask for that? Right. Here's your mark. Now I'm calling up the approach to find the weather. Do you see it? Yes, number two. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we have learned from that. It's not going to be said. Yeah. The way we wanted us to budget. Yeah, so that's right. Um, it's kind of cut in chunks. The cost extension now is $20 million. Yeah. 
uh, if it's to run through August 2024. Does our current budget run through August? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the same thing. Uh, six point five million is the price of the model plan. So, no, seven million. Again, on my support funds, twenty five development assistance. Okay, so six point five million is for that's what you budgeted. I think what's we need to do is about this additional budget. The six million. The six million. But this is how we budget. Yeah. So the remaining mortgage is three and a half to be funded at a later date. I don't think okay. they want us to budget that. Okay. But I thought what we budgeted was five thousand for the core of budgets. Yeah. Now they say six point five. No, no five plus one point three. Which is at the, the, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. research activity. support funds. So, seven million is for instructions. Was the research 1.5? Yeah, I think so. I think the EV said 1.2. I thought it was 1.2. Previous teacher, 1.8 previous one we need already planned. I thought we budgeted 1.2. We budgeted oh, so one point five. The research was 1.5. Oh, yeah, oh, that's one point five. Okay, that makes sense then. 6.5. Yeah, that is. And three to allow enable rapid deployment of the bus against the bottom. So the three million is the extra that we're adding. 3.5. Um, so the total that we're adding is. Six point five million. That's the total new money. Is that new money? Yes, yeah. Okay. Three point five. We don't have to budget. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be budgeted. It's going to be, as we had said, like a slush fund. Okay. We can use it someday later. Yeah. So it. But the three million we have to do now. So it says in your last submission, budget has been given the proposed cost increase of 13.5. Well, the budget shows. Oh. Huh. Budget shows. And this is what Ali can say. Let us know because they said that our total was. 39.5 million. Oh. The revised TEA is 39.5 million, but our budget shows.